a representative of the Living Legend Library, located at the Oklahoma Christian College, Eastern Avenue and Memorial Road. The Living Legend Library is dedicated to the auditory preservation of Oklahoma history through interviews with its citizens who know of the history of Oklahoma. Today we're in the home of Miss Laura Cruz of Enid. Miss Cruz is 97 years of age and unquestionably is one of the few survivors of the run for homes in 1889 and also of the opening of the Cherokee Strip. Miss Cruz has also identified herself by writing historical volumes. We will conduct this interview with the lady toward the objective of having her tell us of the early days of Oklahoma and Oklahoma Territory. Miss Cruz. Miss Cruz is in her home in Enid where she has lived since 1920. The address? I in Oklahoma in the early days can best be described in two words. I quote, hard work, unquote. My brother Will, two years older than I, and I made the race in the Cherokee Strip. We staked adjoining claims. There Don't touch the mic. Don't touch that. Oh, all right. There was an immense amount of work to do. Two houses had to be built, a well dug, a stable built for our horses, a hen house, and a pasture to be fenced, a pond made in the pasture. Then there was a sod to break, a crop to plant, and an orchard to grow. Uncle Sam gave us six months from the time of filing to uh, start our improvements. My time expired the 22nd of March and Will's the 27th. We decided to build dugouts just across the line from each other. I was fortunate to have two streams of water on my claim. Uh, heavily lined with timber, oak and cottonwood trees and saplings while Will was digging the good dugout in the side hill, I cut down saplings, piled the brush for the roof, and pulled tall grass. The part of the roof was uh, underground, and the part that wasn't, we put poles and then the brush, grass on that, dirt on top of that. They weren't, it wasn't supposed to leak, but it did. When my dugout was finished, Will decided he'd build a sod house. He uh, plowed the sod, cut it in squares, and I carried them to him, and he built the walls. We uh, had it about half finished when a strong wind came, blew part of it down. Will decided that a dugout be better after all. So I got the material ready for the roof while he dug the dugout. Other uh, claim holders 
had dugouts too. The cattle could uh, walk on top of the roof. One of our neighbors had their new meal ready when a cow fell through the roof down. She wasn't hurt. She brought a lot of dirt with her, got up and went through the screen door and walked up the steps. Changed his mind about the dugout and thought of ha- about the sod house and thought a dugout would be better after all. While he was digging it, I got the material ready for the roof. His dugout leaked too. The project was a well. We had to carry water more than a mile from a spring on the edge of Black Bear Creek. One of our neighbors told Will that he'd witch a well for him. He cut a fork and stick from a willow tree and traced the vein of water from the spring to within a I don't know. To within an eighth of a mile of our dugouts, Will commenced digging. When he got so deep that he couldn't throw the dirt out, he rigged up a windlass. I operated it and got along nicely till one day I let the bucket of dirt fall back in the well. Miracle. Miraculously, it missed Will. We, he gave a man a dollar a day to help him finish the well. One morning, they went down to work on the well and found it full of water. We hauled rock, and uh, Will and the man walled the well. During dry seasons, the neighbors would haul water from our well. With a cross-cut saw, we sawed down trees, cut them in eight-foot lengths, and split them in four parts for posts. The large limbs would make posts, too. With a post auger, Will dug the post holes. I would fill in the dirt and tamp it. We drove to Perry, a distance of 19 miles, to buy our wire. It cost us $325 a hundredweight. There were snakes galore. One day, one dropped through the roof and crawled outside. Mother was gathering the eggs one evening. On one of the nests, there was a setting hen. She put her hand under it to get the eggs and felt something cold. She lifted off the hen and there was a snake coiled up, uh, swallowing the eggs. It sawed uh, down trees, cut the logs in eight foot lengths, the sod to be plowed and uh, crop planted. Will would plant two furrows and I'd walk along dropping the uh, kaffir corn. Then the next furrow would cover it up, just throw dirt enough on it so we'd get a good stand of kaffir corn. There was no use of planting uh, maize on the sod, it didn't do a bit of good. We had uh, dry years and uh, good years. One year, we didn't get any rain until Memorial Day. Then it was too late to plant corn, but we planted 
spring crops got feed for our cattle. One year, the wind blew from the north, and then took the dirt down south, and then the next day it'd take it up north. We'd get up in the morning, and there we could was the uh, prints of our footsteps on the dust on the floor. We never saw <clears throat> any green bugs until 1909. There were some Russians living in the uh, adjoining neighborhood. When they saw the green bugs, they commenced plowing their crop under and planting a spring crop. But we waited till we saw the crop was really going to die, and then we plowed ours under. This Russian said that the green bugs came to Russia every five years. Now the farmers spray the uh, green bugs and save their crop. One year, the uh, chinch bugs were so numerous. We had our wheat field and corn field side by side. So we'll plowed a, a furrow, put a log in the furrow, and got a boy to drive, ride the horse up and down the furrow. This killed the chinch bugs and saved our crop. But we quit plowing, uh, planting corn, wheat. We raised corn all together. We uh, fed the corn to our hogs, hauled them to Perry, a distance of uh, 19 miles, and uh, sell them for $2.80 a hundred weight. Everything we had to sell was cheap. We calves took off from their mother when a few days old, sold for two dollars a piece. If they were allowed to get older, they'd bring as much as ten or twelve dollars. Cows would sell from ten to twenty-five dollars each. One day. Mother took some eggs and butter up to Garber, to our store. She went in, she heard two women talking. How cheap and how scarce eggs are. Mother said, how, uh, how cheap are they? Two cents a dozen, she said. Do you have some to sell? She asked Mother. Mother said, no. Not at that price. Well, I'll give you five cents a dozen, so Mother let her have the eggs. We uh, milked quite a few cows. Mother made butter to sell. She printed in prints and got a good price for the butter. Her butter always brought a premium. We uh, gave a dollar and a quarter for a 48-pound sack of flour, a dollar and a quarter for a pair of shoes, calico, we paid three cents for it. When the Iowa, Sac and Fox, and Potawatomi Indian Reservations open for settlement, Mother and Frank secured claims. There was much timber on them. Mother sold some of her large trees to a man who owned a sawmill. He moved it onto her claim. She gave Will and me trees enough for dimension timber for a 14 by 16 foot house, 10 foot to the square. 
my brothers help Will cut down the trees and haul the logs to the sawmill. Charlie said that he would loan us one of his mule teams to haul our lumber to the strip. Charles had bought the mules from a retired freighter. They would father and follow another team all day long without a driver. The wagon box was taken off and the lumber loaded onto the running years. I had six cows of mothers and we decided to take them too. The first day we drove to my sister and brother-in-law's Lafayette Camel, 17 miles distant. We started bright and early the next morning for our claims 40 miles away. When we reached the Simon River, it was up and getting higher. I was riding my trained cow pony and drove the cattle into the river. Will took one of the horses from the wagon and rode in to help me. The water was getting so deep and I was getting wet. He told me to ride back and he'd take my pony. By this time, the cattle were milling swimming in circles. Some men on the opposite shore called to them. Will used his whip and finally got them across. We started to cross with our wagons. Will made the mistake of letting his team stop to drink. There is quicksand in the bed of the river. As long as you stay in the beaten track and keep moving, you are all right. The old freighters' mules knew this. They started to go around Will's team. I tried to hold them back, but couldn't. One wheel dropped into the quicksand, and they couldn't move the wagon. Will took his load across, unhooked the team, and uh, put them on in front of the old mules. They still couldn't move the wagon. He then hitched his team to the wheel, and they pulled it out of the sand. Will was wet and cold. It was the fourth day of March. He got in the wagon, which had a wagon sheet stretched across the back bows and changed his clothes. I built a campfire, made coffee, and prepared dinner. We were getting ready to continue our journey when we discovered that a calf would soon be added to our herd. There was nothing to do but wait till morning. We put the calf in the wagon next morning and started early. Will and I took turns about driving the cattle. If I was driving the team and we came to a hill, He'd be waiting to put the brake on. We were making good progress when we came to a small hill. Will and the cattle were a considerable distance ahead. I didn't want to take the time to stop and put the brake on. Maybe it wasn't necessary or he would have waited. I drove my team down the hill. The mules followed. When the wagon hit them, they commenced running, struck a culvert, and the rear axle tree broke. A farmhouse was nearby. We got permission to put our cattle in the lot around their straw stack. Will unloaded the lumber, took the axle to Orlando, three miles away, to get it repaired. The folks invited me into their home. The man was a school teacher. In recounting our accident, I said my brother was a considerable distance ahead of us, and I didn't want to take the time to put the brake on. The man said, make haste slowly. I thought this good advice and have followed it ever since. We got two carpenters to help with our house. It was built stockade style. We went to Perry and got boards 10 inches wide and 
strips of uh, batten were nailed over the cracks. Later, we were able to put on a shed kitchen and get the rooms plastered. We made final settlement our, on, on our homesteads. We were required to give the uh, dimension of our house. Will's and mine were seven by 11 by 10 feet. It wasn't questioned. Miss Cruz, could you give me a description of the Cherokee Strip run? We want to record this for posterity, some descriptive, some color about the run. Can you give it to me, please? Yes. Early on the morning of September 11th, 1893, my three brothers, Charles, Will, and Jim, arrived with me at the boundary line between Oklahoma proper and the Cherokee Strip near Stillwater. Will and I were there to get certificates proving that we were bona fide settlers and entitled to a homestead on the land that was to be open for settlement the following Saturday. These certificates were to be carried with us and were to be showed on demand. Charles, my oldest brother, came to make the race with us and find the numbers to our land, for he had been in the first race on April 22, 1889, and was at the time living on his claim northeast of Guthrie, near what is known as Cowboy Flat. To Will and me, the marks on the cornerstones might just as well have been Greek, but Charles understood their meaning. Jim, my brother, just younger, then I would not be of age until the following January, but came along to see the fun, as he termed it, and to drive the wagon containing our provisions and bedding while we made the race on horseback. Although it was very early in the morning, a large crowd had preceded us and a long line was forming in a, what they thought was the official booth. Will and I took our places at the foot of, foot of it. New arrivals kept coming and forming in line. At nine o'clock, when the booth opened, we made the awful discovery that we were standing in line at the wrong booth and that the right one was some distance away. Then came a mad scramble. I was nearly knocked down several times by the onrush, and when I finally got in line, I found myself wedged between two large men with the life nearly crushed out of me. A man fainted and was carried to the shade. With the hot sun streaming down, I wondered how much longer I could stand it when a soldier came along telling the women where to go to get their certificates without waiting in line. Before noon, I was resting in the shade of our covered wagon with the precious paper in my possession. The men remained in line, but the soldiers faced them so they had room to sit down. If one wished to leave, he would get the man next to him to hold his place. Even when night came, they stayed on. That night, the men who were 
nearest the booth were aroused from their deep sh sleep by shouts of, whoa, whoa, the rattling of chains and the tramping of feet. Thinking it was a runaway team, they, uh, they jumped and ran to get out of the way. When the din had ceased, they came back to find their places only to find they had uh, lost them. The sound effect had been produced by some men stamping their feet and rattling chain horses, a ruse to avoid going to the uh, foot of the long line. Fortunately, Will did not have lose his place. There were black people, white people, and people from all walks of life in that waiting throng. Several men wore long, unbraided hair which fell around their shoulders. Upon sight of one of them, someone would be sure to say, there goes a man from Arkansas. This would be followed by laughter from the bystanders. One day, one of these long-haired men came unexpectedly upon a group of men, and before they had time to make their usual remark, he said, another man from Arkansas, now darn you laugh. A photographer came to take some pictures. The soldiers helped straighten the long line in front of the booth as the camera was ready to be snapped, a young man stepped out of the line, pushed his hat back from his face. As he did so, a soldier jabbed him in the back with a bayonet. Get back into the line. You're not so pretty that you need to have your picture took all by yourself. Our slumbers were disturbed during the night by the call. Oh, Joe, here's your mule. Strangers passing our camp in the daytime would say, have you seen Joe? If so, tell him I have found his mule. I do not, do not know how it originated, but I trust that Joe found his mule in time to make the race. The people kept coming in great numbers many of them bringing fine race horses. We had good horses, but not good enough to compete with these. So we drove west to within three miles of Marshall in the one dollar and a half line. We established land value there. We camped in a small valley and awaited the opening day to the east and to the west. Over the hills, as far as the eye could see, were lines of waiting people. On the morning of the 16th, we were up bright and early and cooked and ate breakfast, saving enough for lunch, for we didn't want to build another campfire before starting time. I will leave the boys breaking camp and getting things in readiness for the race while I tell you of my riding costume. I had ridden horseback from early childhood and was considered a good horsewoman. But Charlie, who had been in the race in old Oklahoma and knew how unmanageable the frightened horses became, said that I must ride a man's saddle and ride astride or stay at home. Mother made me a divided skirt and a, a black sateen. With this, I wore a shirt waist and a sunbonnet. It is now nearing 12 o'clock. The wagon is packed and the team hitched to it. 
GM has instructions to follow the Honeywell Trail to where it crosses Black Bear Creek and to camp there. We mounted our horses and waited for the signal, a gunshot. As an extra precaution, Will was leading my horse. The gun was fired and pandemonium rains, rain, shouts, gunshots, rattle of wagons, and the hoofbeat of horses created a never-to-be-forgotten din. People were in horseback, afoot, in covered wagons, and open wagons. Some had their entire family with them, their plow fastened to the side of the wagon, and chicken coops on the back. Others were in buggies and carts. Away we went, the horses just as excited as the people. As we went helter-skelter, I heard a loud laugh and these words, there goes a woman riding a straddle. I turned my head to see them, to see three men riding alongside their horses abreast of mine. I said, yes, sir, I am riding astride. Oh, one man exclaimed, that's the way to ride. I hope you get a claim. If I get one and you don't, I'll give you mine. One woman was riding in a buggy all alone when a man grabbed hold of the seat and clambered in. She struck him with her buggy whip and then had to give her undivided attention to her team. Whether this episode culminated in a romance that do not know, but it certainly had the beginning of one. A short distance from the border, we passed a man who had staked one of the poorest claims in the strip. He was holding with much difficulty a fine-looking racehorse. Give me your names, he called thinking, I suppose, that he might be contested and would want witnesses. Charles called back to him and then said, poor sap, with that horse he could have gotten something worthwhile. Mile after mile we raced, putting level, passing level upland claims. But we were looking for valley land. Ahead of us was a uh, prairie fire set out by Sooners. Fortunately, the grass was not high and our horses dashed through it. Now we are nearing Black Bear Creek and coming into a neck of bottom land widening out in what looked like acres and acres of valley land. How does this suit you, Laura? asked Charlie. It's good enough for me, I replied, and getting off my horse, I drove my stake. As I did so, a dozen men came racing past, raised their hats, and gave me a rousing cheer. Charles and Will had gone on, and when Will thought that he was far enough away so that uh, our stakes would not be on the same quarter section, he drove his stake, then began the task of finding the cornerstones. While Charles and Will searched for them, I rode over to the Honeywell Trail to find Jim. As I entered a ravine, I saw three men watering their horses in a spring. As I passed, I heard one of the men say, 
There goes the woman I told her if I got a claim and she didn't get one, I'd give her mine. This time there was no laughter when they saw me. I've often wondered if they got claims. That night, rolled in a blanket under the starry sky, I slept on my claim and dreamed of the future of a splendid farm all my own. The next day brought a rude awakening when the uh, lines were run on the land where I had driven my stake. There were less than 20 acres of good land and that not all in one field. No one had staked the claim adjoining, which had it about the same numbers. It was a toss-up which to take, but I rather favored the other quarter section. My brothers let me make my own decision. Finally, I said, Charles, why can't I take my claim across the half section line? You can if you want to, was his reply, and that is what I did. This gave me 25 acres of good land in one field. Call it fate or what you will, but when oil was discovered 24 years later, the wells drilled on the East 80 were dry, while small producing wells were drilled on the West 80 where I had driven my state. The old adage has it that a half loaf is better than none. I was truly grateful for the half loaf. The land in the Cherokee Strip was divided into three sections or zones. The settlers were required to pay $2.50 per acre for the eastern part, $1.50 for the central, and $1 for the western portion. Then later on, to the great joy of the homesteaders, the free homes bill became a law, and the only requirement was to live on and cultivate the land for a period of five years to complete home. Mr. Cruz, I understand that you have written a poem about the Cherokee Strip opening and the run for the homes in the Cherokee Strip. Would you be kind enough to record that for us? Yes, sir. The biggest race in all history was September 16th, 1893, the race in the Cherokee Strip. Cherokee, Cherokee, the Cherokee Strip. Camped on the borders were people of all races and creeds with their covered wagons, buggies, and racing steeds waiting for the race in the Cherokee Strip. Cherokee, Cherokee, the Cherokee Strip. When the signal was given, we raced Hell mail like hungry cowboys when they hear the dinner bell to get a claim in the Cherokee Strip. Cherokee, Cherokee, the Cherokee Strip. We staked our claims, built houses of sod, plowed the ground, and gave thanks to God for our claims in the Cherokee Strip. Cherokee, Cherokee, the Cherokee Strip. Our menu, when the country was new, was Kaffir corn bread and rabbit stew, and we worked hard in the Cherokee Strip. Cherokee, Cherokee, 
the charity strip. Times have changed. Bigger crops we grow. Up from the uh, ground, the oil never ceases to flow, bringing wealth to the Cherokee Strip. Cherokee, Cherokee, the Cherokee Strip. Sons and daughters of the pioneers will carry on through the coming years and keep great the Cherokee Strip. Cherokee, Cherokee, the Cherokee Strip. This cruise the Living Legend Library at the Oklahoma Christian College at Oklahoma City. Eastern and Memorial Road is truly grateful for this reminiscent interview that you have awarded us. We trust that we have not tried your patience nor your physical welfare too much. Thank you very kindly.